uh, Leo Zagami, I, I, I want to finish up with you on uh, astrology. They admit a lot of pubs are obsessed with it, a lot of presidents are obsessed with it. Uh, I mean, the elites make a lot of decisions on this ancient pseudoscience. I know astronomy came out of it. I know a lot of mathematics came out of it. So, I, I mean, I, I kind of respect people at least that are at least into mumbo jumbo because at least they think something else is going on. At least they're looking for things. Maybe in the real world they look for things as well. So, so I'm not, you know, calling everybody superstitious. I don't really buy into it. But the Vatican really does, don't they? Well, it all comes from uh, what has been defined in more recent times uh, in the 18th and 19th century as astrotheology. So basically, uh, the deities and, uh, of course, relate with the stars, also in ancient Babylonian cults. So basically, they are going back to those primitive cults we were talking about earlier. They uh, respect these cults uh, and they respect these stars as they are gods. So they calculate their position in relation to uh, the Earth because they think that it actually influences them and it also amplifies the ritual that they actually do on that specific day, in that specific hour, which every single hour of the day, Alex, every single minute of the day has a different spirit. And um, every and culture on earth worshipped according to the stars, basically the same way, and gave human sacrifices. So now we launch wars on these dates. Uh, the elite really do believe in it. The elite believes Every in billionaire it. I've known has secretly been obsessed uh, off record with the occult, with astrology. I mean, this is what the elite are into. Well, it seems to work, you see, because uh, on, at least on the dark side, when they, for example, sacrifice something, can be an animal uh, like uh, Babalao in, uh, in Cuba, in the Santeria, or it could be actually a human being like certain uh, satanic cults do, it actually seems to bring empower the egregore of this group, so the thought that this group has together, empower them with some uh, specific power that they might have, you know, uh, especially uh, at a materialistic level, not at a spiritual level, of course, because at a spiritual level, uh, this is all garbage. They certainly are into it. So is it basically like a Ouija board, if you believed in that? Is it something the spirits use as the interface? And so the belief in the movement of the planets becomes something through which demonic spirits manipulate the elite? Well, even the lodges of Freemasonry, even the good lodges, even the lodge where George Washington was initiated, had to follow this course. It meets at a certain hour, in a certain day of the week, and, and, and the ritual is conducted following, basically, you are reflecting below what is above. This is a rule of the Emerald Tablets that is followed by the occultist. 45 seconds. What's your view of George Washington? He was a great, I mean, he was not only a Freemason, I, I'm also a Freemason, so not all, all Freemasons are bad. There is also a good side to Freemasonry. I hope one day we can talk about that. But in any case, George Washington was a great guy. Like you said, he was trying to uh, get that independence from that aristocracy, that royalties in Europe, from the church in Europe. He was really somebody who was laying the foundation for a great nation, which is the U.S., which should really reflect this liberty and still does. But for how long before the mondialists will shut down everything? Because uh, like you, you, I see what you said the other day about the FBI starting to investigate you. Well, of course, uh, when you start discussing things like the Vatican, you become even more of a target absolutely i know that god bless you Lee, leanne's coming up welcome back to the alex jones show you are now listening to the fourth hour overdrive i am leanne mcadoo sitting in and kit daniels are one of our lead writers here at Infowars, is joining me as well uh we're going to be kind of wrapping up some of the key intel that we just got uh listening to leo zagami uh, talking about the Pope invoking globalization. Uh, Kit Daniels, I wanted to get you in here because you've done uh, quite a few reports, a pretty stellar reporting there, uh, giving a little bit of history on on the Jesuits and, and sort of what this means. You know, I, I never really understood it or why so many people were so concerned with the fact that the Pope is a Jesuit. And, you know, I was kind of researching sort of the dark corridors of the Internet. Um, so... For those of us who just don't understand, educate me a little bit. Why why should people be concerned about this? What's the big deal? Well, uh, ever since the 1930s, the communists have been slowly uh, kind of infiltrating the Catholic Church and its power structure. Excuse me, the power structure to kind of uh, hijack it and take it over from within. 
And, you know, decades later, we saw the Jesuit movie, movement come out of Latin America predominantly, I think, in the 1970s. And it was, I found this really interesting. I found this on the internet. And this lady by the name of Bella Dodd, who was a, she used to be an ex-communist party of America back in its heyday in 40s and 50s. And uh, she later turned Catholic in her, in her last uh, stages of her life. But she admitted that as a communist agent, she uh, she encouraged over 1,000 of leftist radicals to to start joining uh, Catholic seminaries and to slowly take over the Catholic Church from within. And she explained that of all the world's religions, the Catholic Church was the only one feared by communists because it was its only effective opponent, opponent especially since the Catholic Church had very strong ties to Latin America and South America, where you saw these communist regimes uprising. Mm -hmm. So you have like, in a lot of these countries back in the day, were kind of more or less failed states. So the only thing that was very stable and had been there for centuries was the Catholic Church. They were the only ones that were, you know, could stand effectively against the communists that were trying to take over those countries at that time. Right. I, I was looking something where um, Hitler actually said, I learned a lot from the Jesuits. Some, you know, or, or mm -hmm. Stalin, or who else do we have um, uh, that um, was also like Jesuit educated? Mm -hmm. I, I, you see it a lot with this communist leadership, yeah, which is pretty interesting, I guess. Um, so now, obviously, with the Jesuits, they have the vow of poverty, mm -hmm. and so a lot of people say, "Well, that's socialism," and they're not. They also take this vow that they're not going to take higher office. Well, now we have the Pope. I mean, the highest office mm -hmm. in the land, so to speak. Well, my whole problem with liberation theology, which I think came out, kind of emerged out of the 70s, I believe there's like a Brazilian theologist that really developed the concept and the Jesuits took it over, made it one of their own, was when I was in college, I took a philosophy class and one of the, uh, the I had one of those essay question tests. And one of the um, questions I had was, you know, Jesus sounded a lot like a socialist, but was he a socialist? You know, yes or no, what do you think? And I wrote on the answer, I was like, he wasn't a socialist because yeah, he pushed, he said some of the same things socialists say about, oh, we got to fight for against poverty and this and that. But here's the clear difference between Jesus and socialists in libertarian, uh, liberation theology. Jesus never, as far as I know, advocated the violent use of force to, in order to achieve those ends. Mm -hmm. And that not only is that the, uh, very definition of socialism, that's also the very definition of government in itself. I mean, government simply is a monopoly on the use of force in a given territory. Right. Well, yeah, look at this headline. Um, I believe this was the Financial Times. Can attack helicopters save UN peacekeeping? Yeah. So we got the UN peacekeepers who are really just like the UN's military. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just the irony of calling them peacekeepers when basically they're sent in there with weapons and tens of thousands of troops. Um, you know, keeping the peace. It's interesting <laughs> you say this because it's just like this whole inverted reality. You have them calling peacekeepers people who are soldiers in a war. Right. Same time, we have the Catholic Church and the Pope calling themselves, well, not so much the Catholic Church, but the kind of the power structure in the Pope claiming to be this spokesperson for Christianity. But at the same time, he's almost doing the complete opposite of that. He's pushing for socialism, more government regulation, just about anything that goes against the teachings of Christ. Right now, coming up in the next segment, we're going to be getting Jakari Jackson in here. He uh, he has just returned from this papal coverage, and of course, one of the big things that uh, one of the big stories coming out of it was this uh, that the, the Pope uh, basically talked about the failure of the cross. So there's a lot of confusion over what did he mean by that. Some people say, you know, well, Christ was on the cross saying, "Why did you forsake me?" But really, he was prepared for that the entire time. He said, "I'm going to you know do this." To, yeah, he, he predicted his own death. Right, exactly. So for him, that was his ultimate sacrifice. It wasn't a failure on his part. <laughs> and so what do you make of that? I mean, is the stage being set for one world religion? Um, th there, A lot of people are talk using this term Krizlam, which I've never, I might not even be saying that right, because I've never heard of it, Krizlam, where they're basically m trying to merge Christianity with Islam. Mm -hmm. And so you're, I mean... Just the fact, for instance, Ben Carson was being berated by Jake Tapper saying, you know, you say you don't want a Muslim president. And he's over and over again saying, no, what I said was I don't want a president who's going to whose religion is not going to, uh, you know, will be higher than the Constitution. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's a Christian, anyone. 
And so you're seeing a lot of people attacking Christianity, but then really pumping up Islam. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's just, it's kind of interesting to see that it really is, there really is some sort of um, a movement an yeah. undercurrent of this it's, movement. It's interesting you say that. one world religion. It ties directly into what Bella Dodd once said in a, when she was giving a speech in the 50s. She said, quote, The whole idea was to destroy not the institution of the church, but rather the faith of the people. And even use the institution of the church, if possible, to destroy the faith through a promotion of a persuado religion. Something that resembled Catholicism, but was not the real thing. Once the faith was destroyed, she explained that there would be a guilt complex introduced into the church to label the church of the past as being oppressive, authoritarian, full of prejudices, arrogant, and claiming to be the sole processor of truth and responsible for the divisions of religious bodies throughout the centuries. This would be necessary in order to shame the church leaders into an openness to the world into a more flexible attitude towards all religion and philosophies. The communists would then exploit this openness in order to undermine the church. And I wanted to bring up this quote because this really ties into the so-called liberal drift of a lot of denominations today, not even just the Catholic Church. Like uh, the Episcopalians, like back in 2003, they had a, uh, I think they elected a bishop that started pushing for gay marriage and this, that kind of alienated more of the conservative uh, churchgoers in that denomination. And so, and I kind of set a president. Actually, before that, you had in 1977, like the... Episcopalians had a, uh, I think it was in St. Louis, they had a convention mm -hmm. and they wanted to, uh, they changed their book of common prayer. And so you already had some right. more, like the most conservative churches in that denomination started splitting away. And that's what they call the continuing Anglican movement now. But now in 2003, you know, they, they kind of started pushing for gay marriage and women, women priests and whatnot. And once again, and you see this Pope a lot has actually been pushing to say that that's yeah. the church of the past. We need to be more yeah. open to to bring in new followers yeah. and to keep evolving uh, with the times, so, basically. What's interesting about all this is that, like you said, they're pushing this openness, but all the more conservative churches are breaking away from the denomination. Like I think the Anglicans, the continue, uh, Anglican Church of North America broke away from Episcopalians like 2009, I believe. And But so you have kind of the Episcopalians, which are now more of a, a very liberal denomination. Methodists are sort of, a lot of the Methodists are sort of going the same way. And, but these churches are all declining in membership. Mm -hmm. They're getting so open and liberal and whatnot that people stop going to church altogether. Right. And now, so I know uh, one of the topics of Leo Zagami's book is this 900 year prophecy that this is, this might be the last Pope. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about the the black pope that's something that i had I, you know read some things online and everything the black pope sounds so nefarious uh, but the superior general of the jesuits is informally known as the black pope because of the power of the position that he holds there mm -hmm. so is that what you're speaking about when you talk about their influence that they've slowly been sort of infiltrating and and yeah because the inherent weakness of anything that with a power structure is the fact that it can be People can take it over from within. They can hijack it. They can infiltrate it. Mm -hmm. That's what we're seeing with the Catholic Church. Because now, like I like I told you before the show, you know, if if the Pope is really a devil worshiper, for lack of a better term, I mean, what would be his highest aspiration? It would be to become the Pope. So, right. and that just sets an example. I'm not saying that he is or not, but it shows you that people who want power are going to have a bias towards positions of power. And same thing we see in the government, you know, the worst people that the worst people in the world end up in government positions because they're attracted to the power and the power structure in itself. Well, I mean, that's pretty interesting. I mean, coming up in the next segment, I want to take a couple of more phone calls from people that were uh, just trying to get in to speak with Leo Zagami since we're still sort of talking on on that same subject. But it's kind of interesting that a lot of people think there's something going on with the Pope. One of the number one search terms on Google was is the Pope the Antichrist and all of this stuff is, I mean, it's kind of interesting that there is sort of that idea that there's maybe evil in our midst. Mm -hmm. Well, at the very least, he's practically helping to destroy the faith. I mean, nowadays you see Muslims that are coming in the country, they're buying up all the churches, you know, like in the 60s and 70s, we had a heyday of Christianity here in America. All these, the churches that you see today, a lot of them were built at that time. But now the, the, uh, congregations are suffering so badly because of lack of membership. They can't pay their bills. So they're having to sell the churches to Muslims. And now, 
you know, American Baptist Church down Main Street, USA is now a mosque. Right. Yeah. 